United States of Mexico. Um, comes independent in 1821, right? And on Monday, we talked about the Indians of Texas that we have over here on the, on the upper left, um, you know, stand in for all these different groups. And Dr. Todd Smith talked all about, you know, not just that there's these groups that are here in different parts of Texas, but that migration is a part of the story for the Native Americans in Texas as well, right? You have the Comanches coming in in the 1730s, right? After the Spanish are already in the region um, and dominating what we would call then sort of West Texas, more like West and Central Texas today. Um, Dr. Smith also talked about Indians moving out of the United States and into modern day East Texas during the 1820s and early 1830s. And so you have this constant migration of different groups, right? Uh, coming in and out of the region. Uh, on Tuesday, Dr. De La Teja talked about the Tejano perspective of this period, right? So this is uh, the figure I've got up here for standing in for Tejanos is Jose Antonio Navarro. Um, and, you know, the Tejanos are holding on to a couple of places in Texas, right? San Antonio, La Bahia slash Goliad, and, and a little bit of Nacogdoches. Um, and they don't control Texas. I want to emphasize that. I know that came across, but they don't control Texas when Mexico becomes independent. They really don't control Texas throughout most of the 1820s. The Tejanos um, are mostly present in San Antonio and La Bahia, but they know they're at the mercy of the Comanches, right? And the, the power struggles out there. It's really the Indians of Texas that control most of the territory. Um, throughout all of this, and so on Wednesday, we heard from Dr. Will Fowler, um, about what the perspective was across the rest of Mexico. And so on the bottom left here, I have um, Manuel de Miri Terran, right, the Mexican official who comes up to Texas in the late 1820s. And in Mexico, I think one of the things we got from talking about talking to Dr. Fowler is that Mexico as a nation is really trying to figure out what to do with itself as a nation. And Texas is this far flung little corner frontier area that you know, they want to solidify and stabilize, so they approve Anglo immigration as a least bad option for doing that. But they don't pay a lot of attention to it until things start seeming to spin out of control by the late 1820s with the Fredonian Rebellion, and then they send Tehran here to do a report. Right? Um, and then our last group that we heard from about yesterday from Dr. Greg Cantrell, uh, the Anglo-Americans who come into Texas. So the image on the bottom right here is of Garrett Gross, one of the most wealthy planters who comes to Stephen F. Austin's colony, right? And, you know, I took fourth and seventh grade Texas history. We started with the Anglos. But the reality is they're walking into a landscape of all these different peoples and all these different movements um, and all these different agendas that they're part of and they have their own agenda but they're walking into a landscape where all these things are happening. So the Tejanos invite in the Anglo-Americans because they need the development of the region and they want the Anglos to bring in the cotton economy and therefore are willing to bring slavery into the region. Right? Anglos, when they come in, get into fights with the different Indian groups in the region. Right? Um, and Dr. Smith talked all about that. And then in Mexico City, at the beginning, they're saying, well, this is not our first choice, but..." It seems like the only way to stabilize what's going on in Texas by bringing in Anglos and making them Anglo-Mexicans, if we possibly can. But that starts spinning out of control by the late 1820s. And so what we get to is the situation by 1830 where Mexico City starts clamping down. And that's really the beginning of the road to what becomes the Texas Revolution in 1835 and 1836. And that's why I want to pick up the story that we've been continuing up till now and bring it up to the revolution itself. As I'm doing this, the question that I always ask my students that I want to put in front of you guys is, how does the overlap between all these people and all these different agendas and perspectives lead to the outbreak of violence and revolution by 1835? It really is this overlap between different groups. You have to understand their different perspectives to understand why they acted the way they did in 1835 and 1836. Um, Texas is a contested place. That's what I want to emphasize, both throughout this whole institute and right now. Texas, throughout all of this, is a contested space. And that really is at the basis of the conflicts that ultimately lead to the revolution. Right? The place to begin, where I always start talking about the road to revolution, is with the Manuel de Mir y Terran report. Right? And so I'll pick up where Cantrell mostly left off last time, which is, you know, 
Tehran is sent up to the colonies. Officially, he's supposed to inspect the border between the United States and Mexico, but his, his real purpose is, is explicitly to spy on the colonies and to write a report so that Mexico City will know what's going on, how this is developing, and really give you know, Mexico City a true perspective. Tehran is deeply alarmed by what he sees because Anglo-Americans have poured into the region. 1830s, about 10,000 of them. And so they vastly outnumber the Tejanos in the region. They're not paying attention to a lot of Mexican laws. They're importing slaves in huge numbers, despite efforts at the state level to try to prevent that. And he's basically saying, this is spinning out of control. So what we really need to do is, is, is take drastic action and, and outlaw American immigration into Mexico, right? So he sends a report to Mexico City where it gets in the hands of this gentleman on your screen right now, Lucas Alman, which if you know um, Mexican history, he's a huge figure in the early Mexican nation. Um, he's he's kind of like uh, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton uh, in terms of the roles he plays in the early Mexican government. Um, there's a new biography that's being written about him. He's a huge figure. But he is basically the Secretary of Relations at the time, which is sort of like Secretary of State uh, for the United States. So he's the, besides the president, he's the most important person. He gets this letter from Tehran, this report, and he says, okay, we need to do something. So he marches it down to uh, the Mexican Congress, and he says, we need to get a law passed that ends American immigration. So they do. And this is the law of April 6, 1830, which I will point out, almost every single, I think every single presenter up until now has invoked this law and talked about its influence and its perspective from their particular groups. Um, it's fundamentally important, right? So I, I want to emphasize, if you bring up you know, moments in all of this, this is one that I would think is worth really spending some time on with your students, because it's a pivotal moment that scholars recognize um, from all different angles. And so I'm sure most of you know the basics of the law of April 6th. The way it's often taught is the first bullet point here which is you know, the main thrust, which is no more American immigration into Mexico. Basically, no more. No more colonists. You guys are spinning out of control. And what this represents is Mexico City trying to clamp down on what's been happening and regain control of, of Texas as a wayward sort of province, right? Typically, we end that conversation right there, but there's so much more in the law of April 6th, and we're going to talk about it in the document session um, after the break. We're going to break it down a little bit, but um, that's the main thrust, but then there's other pieces that help support that, right? So the second major thing I always point out to my students is that the law of April 6th enabled the second bullet point here, Mexico's president to establish forts in Texas and begin collecting taxes. All right, and that's really important because again, that's Mexico City trying to clamp down on what's happening in a province that seems to be spinning out of control, at least out of their control. And so the collecting taxes things, my students always go, whoa, it's like the American Revolution. You do that, you're gonna make some people mad. And that's you know essentially what was gonna happen. But I wanna emphasize, Mexico was within their rights to do this, right? When, when Austin started colonizing, they had exempted the colonists from taxation for a certain number of years. And then it was gonna, exp expiration was gonna expire. It was like sort of like temporary like uh, incentive to come. You know, come over here and you don't have to pay taxes for a couple of years. Um, they knew it was gonna expire. And so they're not just pulling taxes out of nowhere. I wanna emphasize that. Mexico City had absolutely every right and had told the colonists from the very beginning that this would be, would be the case. So they're gonna collect taxes and that's why Mexico's president gets you know, the authorization here to build some forts. They want to collect taxes, yes. I mean, but they're not really worried about the revenue. The purpose here is to keep an eye on the colonists and to have federal troops in Texas who are loyal to Mexico City to keep an eye on what's going on in Texas, all right? That's a big thing. And then the third thing is a piece, the third bullet point here is a piece of something we've been talking about kind of on the margins um, throughout the week, but I want to bring to the forefront which is that the law of April 6th tried to stop the further importation of enslaved people into Texas, all right? And you guys remember yesterday, Can Dr. Cantrell was talking about how cotton was blowing up in the American South and the colonists who are coming to Austin's colony are farmers who are growing cotton. 
and as many of them who can afford them are bringing slaves with them. In fact, Austin's land policy rewarded you if you brought slaves because you got more land for every enslaved person that you brought with you. Um, Mexico City didn't like slavery, but in their national constitution, they decided the way to deal with that was to make it an issue for the states to regulate. Well, Texas is a part of Coahuila, as you guys remember from some of the earlier presentations. And so Coahuila, Texas passes its state constitution, and that state constitution also outlaws slavery. So the colonists in Texas, they don't give up slavery. What they do is they get the Tejanos in San Antonio to pass a law in Saltillo in the state Congress um, that says you can have indentured servants on contracts. And so the way that Texans, Anglo-Texans in Austin's colony kept slavery alive for a while is that they, they freed their slaves and then made them sign 99 year service contracts and so slavery was continuing under the legal ruse of contracts. And that's one of the things that Tehran wrote in his report and was saying is a terrible thing and they're thwarting our laws. So that's why, that's why the law of April 6, 1830 is trying to uh, cut off the further importation of slaves from the United States. And that's a part of cutting off further American immigration into Mexico. It all ties together, right? All right. This is in the, your standards for TEKS, right? The revised TEKS, Sporting Standard 7.3. A, describe the chain of events that led to the Texas Revolution, including the Mir Tehran Report and the law of April 6th. This is fundamental. So I always emphasize this as something you really wanna hit hard if you want your students both to understand um, what happens next and, and, and hit the TEKS as we need to hit the TEKS, right? So Mexico City hoped this would solve all these problems. Did it solve any of these problems? No, not really. And, and what it did instead was, was, was increase tensions. Um, so what happened is that Mexico City moved very quickly um, to establish these forts, right? And so at the mouth of the Trinity River, so the Trinity River down here, it comes down to Galveston Bay, they established a fort Anahuac. And then at the mouth, essentially, of the Brazos River, right here in the heart of Austin's colony, they established a fort called Velasco. And the reason for these forts is, again, to have federal soldiers there and to collect revenue. Um, but if you suddenly put troops there who are suddenly charging taxes that the colonists have been paying, how did the colonists react to this? Not very well. And so you have, you know, what are often called the disturbances of 1832, where you have fights break out at both Anahuac and Velasco, right? At Anahuac, this is the a famous uh, scene in Anahuac in 1832 when some runaway slaves from Louisiana take refuge in uh, the, the Mexican fort there. And then the Mexican commander, who's actually a Kentuckian named John Bradburn, he goes by Juan Bradburn, um, but he, he protects the runaway slaves and then William Barrett Travis and a guy named Patrick Jack uh, come challenge all that. There's a big fight at Anahuac, basically. Um, there's another fight that breaks out at Velasco when some Anglo-Texans try to take a cannon over to Anahuac to blow up the Anahuac fort, and they get into a fight with the Mexican troops at Velasco, which kills a number of, of Mexican troops and, and Texans as well, Anglo-Texans as well. And basically there's bloodshed in 1832 and conflict and fighting that goes on, right? right? Um, this increases tensions. There's actually shooting and fighting that's happening, right? Um, does Texas want to revolt? Do Anglo-Texans or Tejanos say, all right, we're shooting now. We should, we should have a revolution. You know, I ask this to my students when I teach the Texas history survey, and they always go, yes, of course, because they know that's coming eventually. And I'm like, no, nobody is saying we need a revolution at this time. Um, everybody in Texas doesn't want a big fight because there's too much to lose, um, but they do want things to change, right? So both the Anglos and the Tejanos, in reaction to the law of April 6th, 18, uh, 1830, and then the fights that are happening at Anahuac and Velasco, saying, we've got to solve this problem. What are we going to do? And their solution is not independence. Their solution is separate statehood within Mexico. All right. So the map I brought up right now is Texas, you know, in the late 1830s, or sorry, mid-1830s. And I know you guys know this, but you know, Texas is attached to Coahuila, right here. We've, we've talked about this in some of the earlier presentations to this gigantic state of Coahuila, Texas. And 
Saltillo, you guys will see right down here, so, uh, the bottom kind of left corner here. Saltillo, you know, is the capital of Coahuila, and now it's the capital of Coahuila, Texas. It's very far from, from the rest of Texas. And Coahuila itself doesn't really seem to be very responsive to what's happening in Texas. So the Coahuilans who dominate the state legislature, you know, have their own ideas like outlawing slavery. And the Texans, and by that I mean the Anglos and Tejanos, think that, you know, most of the problems they're having are because they're stuck with Coahuila. If they could be their own separate state government, if Texas could be its own official state, then they could solve all their own problems. They could write their own state constitution, which would surely protect slavery, because the states were allowed to do that on their own if they wanted to. And, and then they could, you know, they could regulate all their own affairs and not have to deal with all of these challenges they've been getting from the state level and, and maybe now the federal level, right? The point I'm getting at here is that the Texans, Anglos and Tejanos, are what we would call strong federalists at this time. I know you guys you know, heard and, and used the terms federalists and centralists, but I want to emphasize to you guys, this is important as a concept because when Texans say they're federalists, what they mean is that they're in favor of states' rights, right? Within Mexico, um, if you're a federalist, it means you believe in the federal constitution that gave power to the states to decide most of their own issues. So you believe in, in states' rights as a federalist. And for Anglos, that state right, much as it will later be for the Confederacy, is about protecting slavery for the cotton economy. For the Tejanos, it's the same purpose because they, they, they don't want slavery for its own sake, but they do want the Anglo colonists to succeed because it brings in economic development for them. And so Anglos and Tejanos are very strong federalists. They think states should be able to decide things for themselves because it'll protect their interests. And so their solution to all these problems is let's just be our own state. And so the Anglos hold um, some conventions. That's it's a very American thing at this time to hold a convention and, and say what you want. So in 1832 and 1833, they have a couple of conventions. By the way, those are illegal under Mexican law, but the Anglos kind of ignore that. The Tejanos don't have their own conventions, but they do write some strong letters saying that they, they want the law of April 6, 1830 repealed, and they think Texas should be an independent state, not independent of Mexico, but a separate state. In Coahuila. We actually read one of those documents with Dr. De La Teja, the 1832 petition from San Antonio. He was reading with you guys, so you guys have that as well. And so the Anglos and Tejanos agree what we need is a separate state government. So they come up with an idea and a proposal, and they hand it to Stephen F. Austin here, who we heard all about yesterday. And they say, Steve, you go down to Mexico City, please, and then convince Mexico City that we should be our own separate state. And they picked him because, as Dr. Cantrell talked about yesterday, Stephen F. Austin was, you know, he was a he was a smooth operator for his era, right? He was um, he was somebody very much respected and admired and trusted by Mexican officials at virtually every level. He took his Mexican citizenship very seriously, and, um, and you know, he'd done so much to both develop Texas, but, for, but really support the larger Mexican nation. He really thought of himself as an Anglo-Mexican at this time. So he was a good person to, to send down with this, this idea. So I handed this to Austin. Austin says, okay. And he does what he's done before, which is take a 2,000 mile horseback ride from Texas all the way down to Mexico City, right? So we're back at our map right here. That's a long way to go. And he's got a lot of time to think as he's heading down there. And all along the way, Stephen F. Austin he feels pretty confident because he's going to go meet with the president of Mexico. And the president of Mexico, when he's heading down there, is actually a, a very popular figure in Texas, right? The, the president of Mexico at this time is seen as the hero of many Texans because he's really a big supporter of states' rights federalism. And they think he's going to listen to them. And so, even if Austin rides to Mexico City full of vim and vigor over the idea that he's going to get to sit down with the guy who's going to support Texas more than anybody else, Santa Ana, right? Who we heard a lot about on Wednesday from Will Fowler, which I'm going to recommend one more time, Will Fowler's biography of Santa Ana, which is fantastic. It's called Santa Ana of Mexico, and I highly, highly recommend it. And, and he does a really good job of talking about Santa Ana during this period in particular and why the Texans thought he was going to be their friend. 
Because Santa Ana at this time, he's president of Mexico, but he was a big believer in states' rights, or at least he claimed to be at this time. So Austin thinks, well, he's going to listen to me then, because we're a state who needs to have the right to deal with our own affairs, and he'll be very supportive. Austin goes down, <clears throat> gets an appointment with Santa Ana in Mexico City. Not an easy guy to get an appointment with, but Austin, Austin knew some people. And he gets in there, he actually meets first with uh, the vice president, um, but Austin gets an appointment with uh, Santa Ana himself. And they sit down, and they've met before, but they sit down and they talk and Austin says, listen, Santa Ana, um, we kind of need to be our own state. We got tied to Coila when we passed the National Constitution of 1824, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Mostly we didn't have enough people, but <clears throat> now we do have enough people to be our own state. And we could probably do it better than the Coelans could, or have been. So would it be okay, pretty please, if we became our own state and you let us uh, do our own thing? And, you know, none of us were there. I always imagine. Santa Ana kind of rocking back in his chair a little bit going, you know, Steve, I'd love to let you, but I can't, I'm sorry. And, and I, maybe we can talk about it later, but basically no. So Santa Ana says no, and we'll talk in a minute about why. But he says no, and Stephen F. Austin gets mad. <laughs> um, and, and the reason, Santa Ana says no is because by the time you get to 1833, 1834, Mexico is having some serious problems. And we haven't had a chance to talk about that much up until now. But when Mexico becomes independent in 1821, it has a lot of promise and opportunity, a lot of excitement about what the future could be for Mexico. The United States was doing very well and it wasn't very far away. Um, so Mexico hoped that it would have this bright, prosperous future. That didn't really happen for Mexico in the 1820s. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there was problems within Mexico with the military getting involved in political issues. They elect the president and then the military would overthrow that guy and put somebody else in. This happened in 1828, for example. Um, Spain tried to invade in 1829. Spain's not too far away, it's still in Cuba and does not think Mexico should be independent. And then, you know, there's always these revolts that are happening in the Yucatan. It was hard to hold on to Texas. It was hard to hold on to California. So a lot of people in Mexico City, including Santa Ana, by the mid-1830s have said to themselves, maybe we need to clamp down a little bit and put some stability into this country in a way that might help develop it further. So that's one of the reasons that Santa Ana does not want to approve Texas becoming an independent state right now. Because not just him, but a lot of other people in Mexico City are worried that if they do that, what's Texas going to go do? And they don't want to give more power and authority out when they're trying to clamp down a little bit. After the, um, the Tehran report, Mexico City is much more nervous about these sort of things. So, so Santa Ana tells Austin no. What does Austin do? Well, he gets really mad. He goes back to his hotel. And... For all of us who've been angry at somebody and had, you know, here's my cell phone, right? Had our phones. And if you sent an angry text or an email in a fit of rage, and you know that's not a good idea, you know the consequences of that. That's essentially what Austin did in a 19th century sort of form. He went back to his hotel and he got really mad and he wrote an angry letter. And the letter he was sending up to the Tejano his allies in San Antonio. And in the letter, he said, they told me, no, we're not allowed to have our own state, but go ahead and just organize a state government anyway. He basically said, ignore the federal government, pay no attention to what Santa Ana just told me, and do whatever you want to do anyway, and that'll be a good idea. He can't do that. And Austin sent that letter off, it started making its way north from Mexico City. It got uh, intercepted by officials in Coila who sent it back to Mexico City. Santa Ana found out what Stephen F. Austin had done and then ordered him jailed for, you know, treason's a strong word, but for going against, uh, going against his orders and going against the federal government. So 
Justin gets thrown in jail. Jeez, all right. How does, and news, news of this gets back to Texas pretty quickly, right? This is, a, this is the kind of thing people tend to share with each other. So news gets back to Texas. How do you think Texans react? Is there widespread outrage? Stephen F. Austin has been jailed. We must revolt against Mexico. This is a tyranny and a problem. We need to do something about it. That is not what happened. <laughs> Most Texans don't do that. Um, the question, what most Texans do, um, what most Texans do is say, oh, man, that's terrible for, for Austin. I don't like that. But, um, yeah, I hope he gets out of jail soon, right? That's how, that's how most Texans react. I mean, they're, they're definitely upset about this. Don't get me wrong. Austin is pretty popular amongst the colonists. Not completely popular. There are some who don't like him. But um, he's pretty popular. He's one of the most obviously respected figures in the region, but there's not widespread outrage. And I emphasize this because I emphasize to my students, there is not a steady march towards the revolution. We, we think that looking backwards. We want to see this sort of like escalation over time because it seems logical. The reality is most people in Texas did not think that because Austin had thrown in a jail that now we need to revolt. No more than they had when they got rejected from statehood or when they got um, the forts put in and the fights in Anahuac and Velasco, right? There, those are, these are raising tensions, absolutely. But most Texans don't want to revolt. Why? Because they have too much to lose. And that's, that's really key, right? Um, as Dr. Cantrell explained yesterday, when you came to Texas as a part of these colonies from the United States, you were entitled to at least 4,428 acres. That's seven square miles of land. Who guarantees that that's your land? It's not the Comanches, right? It's not the Cherokees in East Texas. It's not even the Tejanos in San Antonio. It is the national government of Mexico that says it's your land. They're the ones who, who signed the deed, so to speak, right? So if you go against that, you might have some problems. And Mexico has a very large, very, very active uh, army that could be marched here at any time. The odds of you losing any fight at all are enormous. And the risk you'd be running, especially if you've been a colonist for 10 years and you built a farm or a plantation, are, are incredible. So most Texans don't want to risk any of that stuff, right? And at the same time, their farms are getting more valuable than ever because it's at this exact moment, and this is also key, and I highly, highly emphasize that this is something important to cover with your students is that in 1830, there begins a cotton boom where prices that are paid for cotton go higher and higher every single year, right? You know how we've had oil booms in Texas and then oil busts as we're experiencing right now? When the oil boom happens and oil prices go up and up and up, right? More people are investing in drilling in, in the Permian Basin in West Texas and then frankly in my neighborhood, Near Denton, we've got a place just behind the neighborhood where they'll, they'll, they'll put, put up a derrick uh, on a mobile truck and then drill out there when the price gets high enough, right? As prices go up for the commodity, production goes up. Well, that happens with cotton in Texas from 1830 up until 1835. Prices go sky high. There's just world demand for cotton. What does that mean? That means these Anglo farms in Austin's colony are worth more than they've ever been. And land in Texas is now more attractive to Southern farmers from the United States than it has ever been. And that leads to something amazing, which we don't almost ever talk about, but is so important to understand, is that there's a population boom that happens in Texas from 1830 to 1835. So the numbers you guys see up on the screen right now are the populations from 1830 to 1835. In 1830, there's about 10,000 Anglos that come into, that are in Texas. 10,000 in 1830. By 1835, five years later, there are 30, five years later, there are 21,000 people who've come into Texas, right? In 1830, Mexico tries to clamp down on American immigration, but at that exact same moment, the cotton boom blows up, and so people come pouring in faster than ever, and that's really the epicenter, if there is one, of the road to the Texas Revolution. You have more Americans coming in than ever, um, and they're trying to, to get land. 
the same time, Mexico is trying to clamp down on movement of people into the territory, right? Um, and then, in the middle of all of this, Mexico erupts into a civil war. And that's something else. This is why this institute has been about all these different perspectives, because you really have to understand the movements from all these different places to understand why things happen the way they do in this crazy period, right? Because in the middle of Anglos coming in and Tejano supporting them and Indians being moved out of this region, in Mexico City, separate from all of that, you have a civil war that breaks out across Mexico, right? And we talked a little bit about this with Will Fowler's presentation on Wednesday, but I want to want to build on that a little bit. Um, and and part of what I was talking about earlier, where again, so we're seeing on the map right here, you know, the United States of Mexico, 1824, uh, as it's created with the the Mexican um, Constitution of 1824, right? And there was this big hope again during the 1820s that Mexico would be prosperous and do really well. And, and, and the truth is the opposite is what happened. And things by the early 1830s have devolved and, and not just in Texas, but kind of all over the nation. And this is a, a big, big problem. And it's why Santa Ana had rejected Texas separate statehood. He's trying to clamp down on authority here. And it's not just him. A lot of leaders in Mexico City feel this way. And what they want to do, their solution, and then what they're trying to do is, is rescue Mexico, is their solution is to centralize and concentrate power in Mexico City. They figure since things are kind of spinning out of control in lots of places, if we have a lot of strength in Mexico City that can dictate the situation and control what's going on in places like Yucatan or Texas or California or wherever, then we might have some stability and that things will, will calm down in that way, all right? That leads to a huge thing that happens in 1835, which I know you guys all know, but I wanted to give that context. Well, Santa Ana <clears throat> overthrows the Constitution of 1824, all right? I always tell my students, this had to be the easiest, fastest coup in world history because Santa Ana overthrows the government. Well, what is he when he overthrows the government? He's the president, right? So he's basically overthrowing himself in a sense, right? And what he really does is he says, okay, I know I was a elected president under this constitution, but guess what? We're throwing the constitution out. So he does. He throws out the constitution of 1824, and now Mexico no longer is a constitutional republic. It's not quite a dictatorship, but it kind of is, right? He becomes the de facto ruler in a sense. He appoints all the people to the new Congress he sets up. And now the individual states in Mexico are no longer states. They are now districts, military districts, that he will appoint a commander governor of. And so what happens across all of Mexico is that he essentially uh, outlaws the Constitution, concentrates power in Mexico City. Why does he do this? Again, it's not because he's a power-hungry, crazy guy, which... Santa Ana kind of is, he's a narcissist, um, he definitely wants power, but he, he couldn't do this by himself. We, don't, we usually pin all of this on Santa Ana is crazy, and that's just way, way too simple. Um, the only way he could do this is that he had the support of a broad network of leaders in Mexico City who thought this was a good idea, right? So it, it worked, he did what he did, but it led to a civil war in Mexico. Between centralists, the people like Santa Ana now who want to centralize and concentrate power in Mexico City, and then federalists, people like those in Texas who wanted the states to have power under the Constitution as it had been written in 1824, right? So I hope that makes sense. This is a civil war that breaks out across Mexico, right? That's the context within which the Texas rebellion happens, right? They don't just all of a sudden feel like doing it all by themselves. There are other places in Mexico that rebel. So, for example, the Yucatan. And in fairness, for those of y'all who know about uh, the history of Yucatan, it was always rebelling. It was constantly um, rebelling against Mexico City. So this, this wasn't exactly new here, but re Yucatan rebels. Um, Zacatecas, which was a silver-rich region that had its own very powerful militia, also rebels um, uh, against Santa Ana. Uh, not against Mexico, but against Santa Ana and his throwing out the Constitution of 1824. So you have these rebellions that, that break out across, across Mexico. What does Texas do? Now, now that Santa Ana has thrown out the Constitution, are Texans now ready to revolt and rebel 
against Mexico? Kind of not really. <laughs> I mean, they're a lot closer. They're definitely alarmed. I think that's what you can definitely say. They are definitely like, whoa, hmm, that seems like a problem. But even now, they're not ready to fully rebel. There's, there's a lot of division and debate amongst Texans. And, and again, I think that is the thing that our students have such a hard time understanding is that they didn't all agree that they were fighting amongst themselves. But if you want to understand what's going on in Texas, really going into the fall of 1835, the eve of the Texas Revolution, you have to emphasize that these guys were all kinds of arguing with each other in all kinds of ways. And there's these powerful divisions in Texas where they can't decide. Like Zacatecas, they can decide. Yucatan, they know what they're doing. But in Texas, you have these divisions and debates, right? And so one that um, is important to talk about is the division between what was called the Peace Party and the War Party, which those names are very indicative of what they, they wanted. But I want to emphasize to you guys, um, really up until late 1835, almost early 1836, most Anglo-Texans who had been there for a long time were in the Peace Party, right? So here we have Jared Gross, which, as I remind you guys, he was one of the, he was the wealthiest colonist to come to Stephen F. Austin's colony. Um, he was a big cotton planter. He had a large number of enslaved people he brought with him who worked on his plantations. And he came early, he came in 1822. So he has a lot of land, he's got a lot of investments, he's got a lot to lose from a war. And so most of the old time settlers, if you wanna call them that, I mean, none of them have been there more than 15 years at this point, but um, the ones who'd been there the longest were the least interested in having a war. And so they wanted to stay and kind of work things out as best they possibly could because they had so much at stake and were you know, possibly going to lose so much, right? On the other side, you have the war party. And here I put in William Barrett Travis as our example because one, Travis was trying to agitate for war. But he's really a good figure to represent the kinds of people who were pushing for war. Travis was a young guy who had recently come into Texas in the early 1830s. And so the people in the war party were usually some of these people who had very recently come in during the cotton boom of 1830, 35. And they had a lot less to lose, right? They didn't have these big farms they'd already established. They didn't have plantations they'd been tending for years. They didn't have a lot of investment in the region. A war might be really a great thing for them because they might be able to, to get all kinds of, of opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have, right? Throughout most of this period, the Peace Party holds the, the, the majority of, of people's attention. But people start moving from the Peace Party toward the War Party. And um, Austin here in the middle, I think, is our best example of that, right? Austin had been firmly for peace, for working things out. That's how he'd always been. He was really a diplomat at heart. Um, but he starts changing his mind when he gets thrown into jail. That will have an effect on you. And you know he's released in 1834. He makes his way back up to Texas. And by the time he gets back up to Texas, he's mad. And he says, quote, you know, war is our only recourse. And so Austin is a part of this transition to the war party as things increase in terms of tensions and anger and angst. But even all of that, even with Stephen F. Austin pushing now towards armed rebellion, that's not enough to have consensus amongst the Texans, all right? Um, and I wanna emphasize this, this is in the readiness standards that you need to hit um, in the TEKS, right? 7.16a, you need to identify different points of view of political parties and interest groups on important Texas issues. Well, I don't think there's much more high level important issues than should we rebel from Mexico or not uh, in 1835. And these divisions within the war and peace party actions, I think are really important to kind of lay out with your students because at the essence, what we have is division. That's not a good way to go into a rebellion. You can't organize people around a common cause and idea. There's just a lot of dissension and different perspectives um, and a lot of debate that results from it. Um, and so um, what pushes things toward finally armed rebellion is, is the, the fight that happens in Gonzales in 18, October of 1835, that really becomes the spark for conflict 
Um, and, and the result, the reason that this happens in many ways is because Santa Ana decides to build up forces um, in San Antonio. And again, we have uh, teak standards that we need to hit that focus directly and specifically on this, right? Readiness standard 7.3C, right? Explain the issues surrounding significant events in the Texas Revolution, including the Battle of Gonzales. So you want to situate this right here, what happens in Gonzales in the context of the civil war within Mexico and these divisions amongst the Texans, right? Because Santa Ana, you know, he, he was worried about what, what, what might happen in Texas. Texas had not rebelled yet, but they might. And so um, Santa Ana started building up troops in San Antonio. So you can see here on the map, right, San Antonio. He started sending federal troops there just in case the Texans did something crazy. Um, while that was happening, the commander in San Antonio decided, you know what, um, a couple years ago, we lent a cannon to the colonists in Green DeWitt's colony at Gonzales to help them protect themselves. You see, um, this goes back to the very first um, presentation on Monday from Dr. Smith about the Indians of Texas. So DeWitt's colony is to the west of Austin, as you can see right here, and it's right at the edge of Comanche territory. And so the Comanches, they would come and raid San Antonio, and sometimes they'd swing through Gonzales on their way back north and raid the colonists there. So the Mexican army gave the Gonzales settlers a cannon, a little tiny cannon, as, a, as something mostly to scare off the Comanches if they came by, right? It, it's, they lent it to them. It's like if you lent your, your neighbor your lawnmower. You're gonna get your lawnmower back at some point, right? They never gifted it to them. It wasn't theirs, but we, it was on loan. Well, now that there might be armed conflict with the colonists, or they're worried about it, the Mexican army says, we're going to go get our lawnmower slash cannon back. And so um, the Mexican commander in October sends 100 um, cavalrymen, Mexican dragoons, as they were known, over to Gonzales. So they ride over to Gonzales. And, um, <laughs> and you guys know the story of Gonzales, which I just think is so fascinating. And I love telling my students because, you know, they get over there and the rains had been going on, so the, the river was pretty high, and they, they couldn't cross the river. So the Mexican soldiers like yelled across the river, we'd like our cannon back. And the Anglos on the other side said, oh, yeah, sure, just wait a sec. We'll, we'll bring your cannon. And instead, they organized themselves together. Um, I don't know why they decided to make a flag. Can you imagine like a meeting in Gonzales where they're all sitting around going, oh, we need to stop this. And somebody holds their hand up and says, you know what we need? We need a flag. We should make one. <laughs> one day it'll be bumper stickers and people will think it's awesome. Um, but you know, th this was resistance. And I want to emphasize, it wasn't resistance to Mexico, right? This is not resistance to the Tejanos. It's not resistance to the state government. It's resistance specifically to Santa Ana and his new regime and overthrowing the constitution. That's who they're rebelling against, not Mexico, right? And you know, they take uh, the flag, they come across the river, they attack the Mexican dragoons, who were not under orders to fight anyway, and so they just retreat. And there's two of the Mexican dragoons who were killed in this whole process. So there is fighting that has now happened, now against specifically Santa Ana's troops, right? By the way, I love, I love showing my students um, the actual, this is, we think, the, the size cannon um, at Gonzales. It's not terribly impressive, right? Uh, but it is the, the thing that they were fighting over at this particular moment. Um, the fight over this is what leads Texans to have to try to figure out, all right, what are we fighting for and what is this gonna look like, right? So here's a newspaper um, article from right after the, the fight at Gonzales, right, saying to arms, to arms, now is the day and now is the hour. We have now been shooting at San Ana's troops. We killed two of them. What is this? What are we, are we fighting for something? Like, what is this? And so in the aftermath of the Gonzales fight, they don't know what they're fighting for, right? Again, my students think like this is the first battle of the Texas Revolution. They have a clear idea. They know where they're going. The exact opposite is true, right? Because of what happens at Gonzales, all the other people in Texas now have to figure things out fast because now you really upset Santa Ana and there's going to be consequences. So you better get your act together. This leads to what's commonly called the consultation uh, in November of 1835, where you basically get all the leading colonists um, in Austin's colony together to say, what are we going to do, right? 
And so they come together in San Felipe de Austin, you know, at the heart of Austin's colony on the Brazos River. By the way, if you've not gone there, they have a brand new beautiful um, museum at the site of San Felipe uh, de Austin, and you can go tour it. It's really well done. I, I highly recommend it. Um, but they all meet in San Felipe, and the point of this meeting is to, is to say, what are we fighting for? All right, Stephen F. Austin presides over this, and at the end of the whole meeting, he comes out and says, okay, we have, we've decided what we're fighting for. And you, know, you can imagine the newspaper reporters there taking notes ready to say, all right, what are you guys fighting for? What he basically says is, we're not sure. And that is really, really important. Um, it, is, it is crucial to understand that even at this moment, as late as November of 1835, even after fighting has been happening, shooting has been going on, um, they don't know, um, they don't know exactly what they're fighting for. We're going to talk about some of that during the document session um, after the break. Um, you have profound divisions amongst Texans as late as November of 1835, right? First, should we be fighting at all? The war party has gained a lot of strength, but it, it, it still isn't dominating every discussion that's happening in Texas. You have a strong peace party still going on. And then the second division is, if you do want to fight, what on earth are we fighting for? Are we fighting to restore the Constitution of 1824 that San Ann overthrew? Everybody agrees that's a good idea. Or are we fighting for independence, which mostly that was to the new arrivals from the United States that were advocating for that. The Tejanos wanted to restore the Constitution of 1824. They hated Santa Ana just as much as the Anglos did. They didn't necessarily want to start a whole new country. A lot of the old time settlers wanted to restore the Constitution because it was preserving their land claims and the wealth that they had been building in the region. A lot of it's the newer guys who are saying independence. The truth is, and we saw this in the consultation, they can't decide. They literally don't know which of it is. They basically say both, maybe, we're not sure. We're just fighting. We know we don't like Santa Ana. That's literally the only thing that they can truly agree on is that they're against Santa Ana and that they'd like to fight him for this. And, and that's what happens next. And that's what really pushes the story forward into the Texas Revolution itself, is that following the consultation, there's no organization. They, they formed a dysfunctional government, but it wasn't even clear what it was a government of. They claimed they were going to build an army, but the only person who was in that army seemed to be Sam Houston. He was the commander, but there was no actual army to command of any great significance. So what you mostly have are mobs of Anglos who moved their way out to San Antonio in December of 1835 to take on the only place they know Santa Ana's troops are, which are, are fortified in San Antonio. Stephen F. Austin at first commands this group uh, as, they're, as they're milling around outside San Antonio here. So here's an image of a map of, of San Antonio as it would have existed. You can see the Alamo, which will become famous later on the eastern edge of all of this. The, the Anglos and Tejanos, by the way, it's Anglos and Tejanos gather outside San Antonio to attack the troops that are loyal to Santa Ana that are inside San Antonio. Um, Stephen F. Austin uh, tries to get them to charge the city, but he, his troops ignore him, so he gets fired as commander. And then Ben Milam eventually takes command and then leads the charge into the city starting on December 5th, 1835. And then for the next five days until December 10th, there's this bloody battle that happens street by street in what's often called the Battle of Behar, and will become kind of the first battle of the Alamo because the the, the troops loyal to Santa Ana retreat east until they take refuge in the Alamo um, under a guy named General Koss. And, and the Anglos and Tejanos defeat Koss and Santa Ana's troops and throw them out of Texas and out of San Antonio. And when they do that, the rebellion is in full form, even if they're not sure exactly what they want the outcome to be. And that's the context that I want to leave you with and that I think you need to share with your students is that this is not a war in 1835-36 that is Anglos against Tejanos. What you have are Anglos and Tejanos working together against Santa Ana. And that's the only thing they can really agree on. Um, but they're working together against Santa Ana and they're fighting together against Santa Ana. And you have to understand that again in the context of what's happening in Mexico. For Tejanos, this is a part of a civil war in Mexico. For a lot of Anglos, it is too. For some of the new Anglo arrivals, it's about independence. Um, that will all shift again in 1836 when Santa Ana invades Texas, lays siege to the Alamo, and it's when basically all Texans have a gun to their head 
um, when the Alamo is under siege and Santa Ana is going to invade the rest of Texas, that both Anglos and a handful of Tejanos decide we need to be independent. And they declare it on March 2nd, 1836. It takes until that long for them to decide what this really ultimately is about. Um, and so it's this fluid process of different perspectives. I think you're really emblematic of the larger um, reality of Texas as a borderland throughout this entire period. All right. So I'm going to stop there.